Okay, good. Recording is on. Welcome, good morning, everyone, to the course BC214, Developing the Human Spirit. And uh, we're going to get into our lesson today. Just want to request somebody to please pray with the class and we will get started. Could somebody uh, pray with all of us, please? And we'll start. Okay, I'll pray some. Okay, Manga, you go ahead. Okay, let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you again this morning, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to to have this union, Lord, to learn about our human spirit, how it can be developed, Lord, to so that we can function to into to the fullness of what you've designed us to to become and to live. Mm -hmm. We pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit will be with, with us, will prepare our heart, will also prepare and use past ashes in the best way that you can, Lord. In your mind, we pray all this in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, Maggie. And good morning, everybody. Thank you for connecting to the class. So, Last week, we um, focused on uh, practical ways by which we can develop the human spirit, how we can strengthen uh, our spirit just as we develop our mind and our body. Uh, in the scriptures, God has given to us ways or instructions on what we should be doing uh, for our human spirit. I'm just going to quickly review that. And then we're going to go into the next chapter, which is uh, for us to look at how the human spirit affects the soul and the body. Uh, the condition of the human spirit, how that affects our soul, which is the emotional part of us, the mind, the will, the emotions, and how it affects also the body, the physical part of us. It's very interesting. Um, that we see uh, the connection between all of this because that will actually motivate us to work on developing a strong inner person. When we realize that, or when we understand from the scriptures that, you know, if our spirit is doing well, it's going to help us do well in our soul and also in our physical body, because there's a strong connection. We will see that today. That's the goal now of the class uh, lecture today. Uh, and then we will close off, hopefully, um, by just giving a few insights on, you know, how the human spirit is affected uh, by words we speak and uh, something else that God reveals to us concerning the human spirit uh, uh, so that it shows us how to take care of our spirit. So let me go ahead, please, and share the uh, PDF. And uh, we'll just quickly review. So we have seen, I'm just quickly reviewing, this is uh, chapter lesson number two, where we said we are primarily spirit beings. We went through this. And this is chapter, lesson number three, which we did last week, um, where we looked at seven ways to develop the born again human spirit. Uh, fellowship with God through worship, prayer, and the word, having times of quietness and communion, feeding on God's word through meditation, the confession of the, the confession of the word of God, praying in tongues, um, exercising our spiritual faculties, uh, of which uh, greatest is love. That means all of the exercise of our spiritual faculties, of course, must be done in love and also receiving spiritually through other people. So we went through this last week. Today, what I want us to uh, cover is uh, to see from Scripture how the condition of our spirit affects the soul, our mind, will, and emotions, and the body. And, uh, and therefore, you know, it, uh, like we said earlier, it also, in, in some way, is what people call our person or personality. Uh, 
the condition of the spirit as it is expressed through our soul and body. People see, oh, here's a person with a quiet spirit. Here's a person with very co uh, confidence. He's a very confident person. Here's a person who's very courageous. Here's, you know, and so on. Uh, they see the expressions of the personality, but it's actually coming out of the condition of the human spirit. And uh, so what we are going to learn is, uh, uh, of course, for our own personal benefit, but also we can use it to help other people. Uh, because when we help them develop their born again human spirit, you know, uh, uh, then we can help them uh, overcome challenges that they would face in their soul and in their body, really. So uh, we, you know, by helping believers strengthen themselves in their spirit, we're actually helping them overcome uh, things that they would face in their emotional life and uh, even in their physical body and also through various challenges and adversities um, that they may face in life. So what I want to just go through is, um, and I've tried to, and I've put this in an alphabetical order uh, and it's not, you know, it's just for convenience. Uh, there is no particular importance in this, uh, but I've just looked through the Bible uh, where the Bible is talking about different um, conditions, different uh, expressions, uh, different experiences of the spirit. And then in many of these verses, you also see a connection of how it is being expressed through the soul or through the body or through what happens through the, in the physical. So um, I just want to quickly go through it and uh, you can definitely take time later on to you know study uh, any of these things that any of these expressions or conditions that might be of interest to you. Um, so we read and I'm just going to go through this fast because uh, the list is quite long and I hope to finish this uh, lesson today. So there is, you know, what talks about, about uh, we've seen scripture, the anguish uh, of the spirit. Now, this is an exodus that the people were under hard bondage labor. So the, the spirit was really crushed, see? And, um, and Job going through his, you know, difficulties in life, uh, he, he expresses it, you know, he says, I'm in the anguish of my spirit and, and bitterness of my soul. So, that's the condition of his inner person and his soul is greatly distressed. You can also see uh, as Job is going through all of this that, uh, uh, you know, he, he's talking about turning his spirit against God. That means he's, this is really, you know, a heart that is angry with God and therefore, you know, uh, that's being expressed by the words he speaks. Uh, uh, than just generally being angry in your spirit. So uh, that means your spirit is in that place where you're upset, you're angry, and then that is expressed through, you know, what we say and do. You can also feel bound in your spirit. Uh, and uh, uh, interestingly, this we will see this later, and, and again, we'll see this again in another chapter where Paul says, I feel bound in my spirit or restrained or constrained. That means I, I don't feel free about what I'm doing, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm feeling uncomfortable uh, in my spirit. And this actually was, this feeling was actually put in there by the Holy Spirit, as we will see. But uh, in this chapter, we're just focusing on, you know, what is he feeling in his spirit? He feels bound, restrained, constrained uneasy in his spirit. Uh, then we see a number of scriptures that talk about a broken and a contrite spirit. You know, uh, my spirit is broken. But you notice that um, when the spirit is broken, there is a whole sense of despair uh, in this case, example. I'm not saying it's always that way, but you can see the connection here. So uh, it says, my spirit is broken. And then he sort of says, you know, I'm ready to die. I'm ready to give up. So really, you know, if, and you can think about this, especially in people who are sick, uh, if they give up, uh, then in, in their spirit, um, then, you know, they're just going to go down very quickly, physically uh, towards death. So as long as we can keep the spirit up in faith, it's going to help them fight 
over whatever they're going through. Uh, there are other expressions of being uh, broken. Uh, the Bible talks about a broken heart, a contrite spirit, and the Lord is near uh, to them. So this is more of a sense of uh, brokenness in terms of being dependent on God. Uh, Independence in God, you know, it's, it's not about me. Uh, I don't have, you know, it's not about my abilities, but God, I come to you completely dependent. So that, in that sense, broken. But there's another sense also of um, how, uh, you know, a, a broken spirit can become, can rob a person of cheerfulness and, you know, therefore keep them in a place of sorrow or despair or what we would sometimes even say is depression. You know, you see this in Proverbs, the contrast between a merry heart that results in a very cheerful uh, countenance versus um, sorrow that's coming out of a broken spirit. And then that merry heart does good like medicine. I mean, it's really good for the body. But a broken spirit dries up the bones. It actually affects the physical body. Uh, you know, drying up the bones is terrible. You know, it's the bone marrow is the place where all the red blood cells are, you know, uh, continuously produced for the body. And so it's like, you know, it's, it's just going down into a place of death. Notice Proverbs 18 says, uh, the spirit of man will sustain him in sickness. So, you know, it connects back to what Job himself was experiencing. But a broken spirit in the sense, a wounded spirit, you know, uh, we're not talking about broken as in what we saw in Psalms, which is about dependence on God. Here we're talking about uh, somebody's wounded, is hurt, uh, crushed, uh, you know, then, that means he's he's given he's, he doesn't have anything to sustain him through his sickness his difficulty. So we're seeing the connection here very clearly between the condition of the heart to the uh, demeanor of the person to the health physical health of the person, you know, and then being able to be sustained through difficulty. Right. So we look at it uh, if you look at it in a positive sense. Uh, you know, if we can maintain that joy in our heart, the strength in our heart, we can, you know, uh, go through uh, challenges and it's going to do good like medicine. We also uh, read about the spirit of heaviness. Um, and now uh, uh, this uh, often, you know, in, in, in modern expressions, we would say spirit of depression. Uh, and of course, it weighs in on the spirit of the person. Uh, causing them to be burdened, to feel heavy, to feel, you know, uh, uh, under pressure, you know, like something heavy on them. And this is called the spirit of heaviness. So that is pushing them down. But then God brings relief uh, by the anointing and causing them, causing people to have the garment of praise. So we could have, you know, a spirit that's weighted down, burdened, crushed, uh, under heaviness, or we would say depressed. We also see uh, being of a calm spirit. That means instead of being agitated, angered, your spirit can stay calm. And that expresses itself through, um, you know, uh, using words um, in a very knowledgeable way, in an understanding way, you, in, in a very judicious way, um, because you're of a calm spirit. Your spirit can be compelled. Uh, that means there's a sense of... Uh, uh, urgency, there's something, you know, you want to express uh, that, you know, you could uh, feel urged on the inside of you. Uh, and, uh, you know, that also is, can also come from the Holy Spirit in your spirit, urging you to say, do certain things. You can be, uh, Caleb was called to be of a, diff a different spirit. That means, you know, you don't have to be part of the pack. Uh, you can be different, you can be daring, you don't have to give in to the peer pressure, so on and so forth. And Caleb is an example of that, where he, God says, you know, he was of a different spirit. Um, we can have a heart, a spirit that is hungering, thirsting, seeking after God. So, um, yeah, as I was talking about, you know, seeking God with his spirit, a spirit that is longing, desiring, and seeking after God. Uh, we also see that there can be error. Uh, 
in our spirit. That means the spirit can be caught up in error um, in our knowing and understanding, our perception, so on and so forth. Uh, we can err in spirit, but then of course God can bring us into a place of understanding and learning correctly, uh, coming into a place uh, where we are corrected. Uh, we see, as in Daniel's case, he was a man of an excellent spirit. Uh, we see that mentioned to us uh, twice here in Daniel. He was of an excellent spirit. And, and if you, you look up what that word excellent means, it's talking about being outstanding. It's being very special. It's being something surpassing uh, than the others. So that's coming from, a, from his inner person, you know. Uh, he was a man of excellent spirit, something that just made him stand out. Uh, become, you know, surpassing all the others uh, around him. Uh, and that comes through, of course, in, in how people perceive or see this person. Faithfulness or unfaithfulness, again, can be seen something that's born in the spirit. Uh, we can be uh, uh, faithful to God, uh, faithful to other people, keeping secrets, uh, being faithful to in marriage, uh, Malachi 2 talks about dealing treacherously or unfaithfully um, uh, uh, with, with a spouse. So God says, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously or, or unfaithfully. So you see that even the, uh, the posture of being faithful, either to God, to friends, or in a covenant, marriage covenant relationship, uh, is something that comes out of the spirit, you know. And if the spirit is shaken uh, and gives place to, uh, you know, whatever causes unfaithfulness, then we could even depart from God or depart from human relationships or from covenant relationship. So see that. Uh, we can be fervent uh, in spirit. That means very passionate, very zealous, you know, uh, burning with zeal. Uh, we see that here. So passion and zeal and, you know, uh, being fervent is something that comes out of the spirit. It's not just an emotional thing, you know. Uh, an emotional thing can be like, yeah, I'm so excited. Uh, I, I, I enjoyed the thing. But to be consistently fervent, consistently red hot on fire. Well, where does that come from? comes from your spirit. It's a posture of the human spirit. Uh, we also see that uh, the human spirit, you can, you can grieve in your spirit. That means there's something that causes you to, uh, 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 to grieve, to feel sorrowful in the spirit, um, which, you know, can often lead to, uh, 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 lead to positive uh, uh, responses, as in, um, uh, uh, being moved to seek God because you are grieved about something. You're, you're, you know, you're, you're, uh, let's say you're upset about something, but you are moved in a very positive way, right? So we also find that uh, Jesus was, uh, he sighed deeply in his spirit, or when he came to the grave of, uh, Lazarus, he groaned in his spirit. So uh, there's this feeling of grieving or sorrow or sighing or groaning in your spirit, but it is moving you in a very positive way to do something, either to seek God in prayer, like um, Hannah did, or Daniel did, or uh, Jesus, when he uh, was before Lazarus' tomb, you know, he, he moved, he said or did things that that gave expression to what he felt uh, in his spirit. Now, of course, the heart can be hardened, the spirit can be hardened, uh, and uh, we see that also. That means uh, it's all, almost like becoming calloused and unfeeling uh, uh, toward uh, God or toward the things of God. And, uh, and uh, uh, we see here that often it's pride or some some other form of sin that causes a heart to be hardened towards God. Sometimes people can be hardened because of pride. Sometimes they can be hardened because of a lust for other things that says, you know, I don't want anything to do with God because I want to have my own way. And, uh, you know, their heart can be 
very calloused uh, towards God, indifferent uh, and uh, stubborn uh, against God. In a positive way, the spirit can be, you can have a humble, meek spirit. Uh, you're walking with meekness before God, or the opposite of that would be a haughty spirit. So haughtiness or humility is also an expression of uh, the spirit. It, uh, what, what somebody has, it carries in their spirit, their attitude in the spirit, the posture of the human spirit. And uh, so you find that many, many times uh, in scripture, humble spirit. And, and in God, you know, God looks for that. He is drawn to somebody who is of a humble, contrite, poor in spirit. So when you talk about being poor in spirit, it's really talking about somebody who is in that place of humility before God saying, Lord, I have nothing. I possess nothing. But in you, I find everything. So that place of humility uh, or being poor in spirit. We also see, uh, you know, being hasty in spirit. So, you know, uh, the spirit is uh, moved into hasty action, impatience, as opposed to being patient. Um, we, as we will see in the next, yeah, I think the next chapter when we talk about it, to next week, uh, the Holy Spirit moving upon us uh, can cause different feelings in our spirit. And here's just one example where uh, when the Holy Spirit is moving upon Ezekiel, he was uh, so uh, moved in his spirit. Uh, he's, he talks about, and he puts it in these words. He says, I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit. So, now, it's like, now what exactly is that bitterness and the heat of my spirit? And uh, we could just say that he must have been so stirred or agitated about uh, the condition of the people in the land. Uh, because, you know, they, God was telling him, look, Ezekiel, I made you a watchman. And uh, I want you to speak my words. Now, these people, they may not even hear you. They may not, you know, pay attention to what you're saying. And so... Uh, when Ezekiel is receiving that kind of a commission, uh, he is, you know, he he feels disturbed, he feels stirred, uh, and and so he's using these words bitterness, heat, um, as the Lord is moving on him and giving him his commission, and the Holy Spirit is moving on him. We could also receive inspiration in the Spirit. Uh, we see here, you know, there's a Spirit in man, the breath of the Almighty. So you can feel the breath of the Almighty in your spirit or be. in other words it's the inspiration of god in your spirit or he gives wisdom in the hidden part that's in your spirit he imparts wisdom uh, you could also make diligent search in your spirit that means your spirit is investigating it's searching god i i i, I need to understand i want to know what is the secret? What is the meaning? So you're, you're making diligent search in your spirit. And, and the psalm is saying, you know, even at night, he's meditating, he's pondering. Why? Because the spirit is searching out something and that, that he's going after. So you can have a spirit and you can have that happening in your spirit. Um, your spirit can feel overwhelmed, uh, over you know, just saying, God, this is just too much for me. And, uh, and 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 uh, uh, that can, you know, of course, cause us to go to God. Uh, and sometimes this being feeling of overwhelmed is just because of all the things that are happening uh, around us. Uh, people setting a snare for us we can be overwhelmed because of the situations we are going through, and uh, make may feel us make us feel distressed. So. When you're feeling overwhelmed, it's, we're talking about just feeling faint, feeble, right? And uh, in some, some, he says, my spirit fails within me. It's like, I want to give up. I'm feeling weak inside me. And sometimes we can feel that way. And that's when we need to encourage ourselves or strengthen ourselves in God. When we feel overwhelmed or weak or faint, 
uh, because of what we're going through, just like how the psalmist uh, is expressing. We can be patient in spirit. You know, that means you're being tenacious, enduring, not willing to give up. You're holding on. Uh, you can perceive in your spirit. We will talk more about this when we talk about the uh, uh, the uh, functions of the spirit. You can perceive. Your spirit is able to see things. Your spirit can be where there is purity, clear, clear spirit. Um, your spirit can be revived. Um, it can be uh, refreshed. Um, and... Uh, so that can happen. You can, your spirit can feel that. You know, so you go to you know, a, a church service or a fellowship meeting and you're refreshed, you know, uh, either through the word, through the fellowship, through the worship, just fathers being around you. So that can also happen. Uh, you can have joy in your spirit, uh, joy in God, uh, because uh, you can rejoice in your spirit. Uh, your spirit can be, and this is something very important we need to be aware of, your spirit can be the ruling factor, the, the, the governing factor in you as a person. Right? If, uh, so it's contrasting here in Proverbs 16, you know, a man who is angry, he, uh, he, uh, he loses control. But if you can rule your spirit or your spirit rules your person, you know, you're better than somebody who can rule over a city. Um, see that repeated in Proverbs 25, 28. Um, you can have a steadfast spirit, firm, resolute spirit. Your spirit can be provoked or stirred up. Uh, and uh, we see that even the Lord stirs up people in their spirit. So sometimes if you're, you feel very, you know, stirred up, it's the Lord. It, it could be the Lord. Uh, stirring you up in you to do something. Many times that's how the Lord leads us, you see. Uh, you feel stirred about something and you go and do it. Um, and uh, Or you could, you know, the, the, here we see it's, uh, 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 Paul, his spirit, he felt provoked in a spirit. Uh, it's comparable to the Lord stirring up King Cyrus or Zerubbabel. You know, there's something, it's like... Uh, an agitation inside you, but it's a good agitation, not a bad one. But the Lord is agitating, stirring you up, saying, hey, you need to do this. It's basically moving you into action about something. We can be strengthened in our spirit, and that's our goal. We can become strong in our spirit and, uh, you know, strengthened uh, with might through his spirit in the inner man. So that that's part. So we... we Whoa, sorry. Um, um, they started construction upstairs, so I have. Um, mm -hmm. They're doing construction upstairs. I'm just going to move to another place uh, because uh, you can't hear me with the noise, right? It's, you can, do you hear the noise being picked up in the mic? It's clear, Pastor. We don't hear the noise. Are, are you hearing the noise now? No, 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 no. You're not hearing the noise? No, Pastor. So far, it has been clear, Pastor. Oh, uh, okay, great, great. Uh, I mean, are you hearing any noise right now? No oh. noise. Okay, then I will continue speaking. Now, I thought you could hear the noise, so this is a good setup. <laughs> uh, some people are doing renovation work nearby, so uh, I thought you 
it is disturbing you. Okay, so I'm just going to continue, and I see some questions in the chat, so I will um, come back and uh, answer those questions. But let me just continue. But um, I'll just finish the content, and then I'll uh, maybe another ten minutes and come back to the questions. So let me go back to sharing uh, the PDF. Uh, you all with me so far? Yes, yes, Pastor. Okay, okay, great. All right, so we just have a little bit more, and then I'll, I'll finish this lesson, and then I'll take up questions. So we can see uh, in Scripture here that we can become strong in spirit. Uh, so that's what we want to do, right? In the other lesson we spoke about, in the earlier lesson, lesson number three, uh, we spoke about how to make our spirit strong. So, uh, and we see, you know, in the case of Jesus and in the, in the case of uh, John, uh, the Baptist, uh, and in the case of the believer in Ephesians 3.16, oh, just become strong, become strengthened in your spirit. Uh, the spirit can be disturbed uh, because of various things. In this case, you know, uh, uh, the uh, uh, man, it's, it's quite interesting, Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, you know, they had dreams. Uh, they couldn't figure out what was going on. And he says, my spirit is disturbed. My spirit is anxious. My spirit is troubled. Um, uh, even the Lord Jesus was troubled, uh, you know, when he, when he knew that somebody was going to betray him. And uh, Paul also says, you know, I had no rest in my spirit uh, when he was concerned about the people um, in uh, uh, in. I think at, at Corinth. So uh, we see that, you know, this can also be there in our spirit. Our spirit within us can be troubled, disturbed about certain things. And of course, you know, if that's happening, then it shows up in, you know, the rest of our emotions and actions. We, we are disturbed in our spirit uh, because of certain external uh, things. Now, uh, you know, God can also make us willing in our spirit. So, uh, like we said earlier, uh, uh, you know, God can move in our hearts. Here we see that people's heart was stirred. This is something similar to what we have seen. The effect of their heart being stirred was the spirit became willing to do what? to offer, to make offerings, to bring, you know, things to God. And uh, this is beautiful, a beautiful example, you know, where uh, God wanted Moses to, you know, get things together to build the tabernacle. But Moses didn't have to go out there and force the people. He didn't have to, you know, try to, uh, you know, coerce them to give. What happened is, God stirred their hearts, and the people, they became willing in the spirit, and they brought things. And that's a, just a beautiful thing, beautiful thing to see. And, you know, as, uh, you know, when, when the Lord leads us to do things, that's how it should happen. Uh, on the other hand, uh, here's another example in Matthew 26, where the spirit was willing. But somehow, in this particular case of the disciples of Jesus, the weakness of the flesh overpowered the willingness of the spirit. So that means the spirit was not strong enough, even though the spirit was willing to uh, was willing to pray. Uh, it wasn't strong enough at that moment. Uh, the flesh was weak. Now I don't know, uh, you know, whether the weakness of the flesh was just their tiredness or uh, their, uh, you know, being unwilling to pray. Uh, but yeah, what actually happened was Jesus was able to pray where his disciples failed to watch with him and that time when he really needed them most. So what we have done here is we've kind of, you know, we just uh, listed in, in, a, in, a, in an alphabetical order uh, various conditions of the human spirit. You know, and you can go through this list again and just ponder about it, think about it and say, you know, hey, uh, uh, we can feel all this, we can experience all this, 
and the human spirit can be in all of these different uh, conditions that we have seen listed in scripture. And therefore, it's going to affect the soul and it's going to affect the body, uh, uh, the actions and so on and so forth. Uh, just a few more thoughts before I uh, close off this lesson. So our goal is that uh, to maintain a strong, healthy, wholesome human spirit. And I want to I want to challenge each of us to do that. You know, uh, because like we saw, the, the, the human spirit can have many different dispositions. The human spirit can be in different conditions. Uh, but if we are careful to make sure that our human spirit is strong, healthy, wholesome, by doing the right things. You know, we talked about the seven practices. So if we do that intentionally, take care of our human spirit, just as we take care of our mind and our body, then over time, even though our outward man is perishing, that means, yeah, we all grow old. <laughs> you know, over time, uh, the outward man is growing old. But the inner man is re being renewed. You know, the inward man is being kept in good shape uh, or being strong, even though the physical body, of course, is uh, wear and tear and growing old. So our goal is to keep the inward man renewed, or keep the inward man in a good, strong, wholesome, healthy shape, so that through, the, through time, even though outward man perishes, the inward man is kept strong, and we can serve God well till the end of our days. Um, a very important thing I want to just uh, place before us is to understand the, how the words, words affect the human spirit. You know, uh, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. But Proverbs 15, 4 says, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. So can you think about it? Uh, a healthy tongue. A wholesome tongue, that means you, your words, your words. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. That means when you speak wholesome words, it is a tree of life. A tree of life is, uh, you know, as we see in scripture, Revelation 22, uh, it is uh, what brings healing and longevity or eternal life, you know. So if you speak wholesome words, it is a tree of life for you. And for others, of course, because your words affect you, your words also affect others. But perverseness in it, that means if I, uh, it's not straight, you're not speaking wholesome words, what can it do? It can break the spirit. So think about it. My words, my tongue, my words can be a tree of life to me and to other people, or my words can break the spirit it can break my own spirit or that means it can crush and hurt and it can crush and hurt other people so words are very crucial now we have also seen in all of these scriptures circumstances situations um, can crush the spirit can overwhelm the spirit we, we've seen that i'm not uh, i'm not you know, forgetting that, but I'm just highlighting how important words are for our own self and when we speak to other people, you know, and so if we make a deliberate choice to keep our words wholesome, it's going to be a tree of life for us and it's going to be a tree of life, a tree of life to other people who hear what we say, okay? Keep that in mind. Lastly, and I think it's very interesting to see this, I wish we had time, more time on this. If you think about this, you look into the scripture, and you look at how the scripture compares the human spirit, analogies. Uh, and these analogies are, you know, God is trying to tell us, look, your spirit is like this, so do take care of it. We will find that, uh, you know, the spirit is compared to a house, a lamp. It's a place of deposit. Uh, it's a spring. It's a womb. It's a ground. It's uh, tables where things can be written on. Uh, uh, you know, by the spirit and so on. And, um, and I think we'll just, you know, we will look at this again next week. Um, I don't want to rush through this, but it's really interesting that God is saying your human spirit is like a house. 
And in fact, if you look at these verses, it's telling us that uh, wrong things want to come and inhabit this house, but we have to guard the house. It's like a lamp. God uses, God uses the spirit. It's a place of deposit. What do you put in the deposit will eventually come out. It's a spring. I mean, this is from where this is the place from which everything that affects your life comes out of. It's a womb. It's a place from where you give birth. It's a ground. So it's, it's a place where you sow and reap. It's a place where you can write things on and it will be returned for eternity. I mean, for the rest of your life. So uh, it's good to think about this and, and, uh, you know, because then it tells, it shows us how important the human spirit is, and therefore how it's going to influence uh, our human experience. So uh, we will pick up on this next uh, week. I want to keep the last few minutes to answer questions. So uh, we will just pause here. Let me look at the chat, and uh, uh, let me let me just try to answer the questions. Um, Okay, so the first question I see here is from Sri Kumar. Can the spirits of heaviness be demonic? The answer is yes. So uh, the actual spirit causing heaviness or causing depression, that's demonic. So we call it a spirit of depression. But uh, what we also, uh, what I was trying to emphasize in Masia 61 was that that heaviness can come upon our human spirit. Uh, we feel heavy. Uh, so I'm not saying that, that evil spirit is, 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 has come into our, our spirit. No. But the human spirit feels weighed down. You know, feels depressed. Uh, and uh, so that's the disposition or the feeling or the condition of the human spirit. But to answer your question, yes, there is a spirit, a demonic spirit of heaviness that can cause heaviness, okay? So usually when we're dealing with people, and I'm not saying all depressions are because of spirit of heaviness, but in many cases, when we're dealing with depression, we deal with the spirit of uh, heaviness, or the spirit of depression, okay? Uh, next question is from Beth. Several times in the Bible it says, God hardened his heart like Pharaoh, King Saul, King Saul. How does that work with freedom of choice? Uh, often it says something like, I will harden his heart so that he will not or will not do something against uh, God's people. Yeah, so that's an interesting thing uh, to consider. Uh, and uh, I think the Apostle Paul addresses that in Romans chapter... Let me see, it's 9, 10, or 11. Uh, Romans chapter 9. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so Paul, Paul the Apostle addresses this uh, uh, in Romans chapter 9. And uh, he talks about, yeah. Yeah. So he talks about, he, he talks about, uh, he mentions Pharaoh also in Romans 9 uh, in, 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 in uh, addressing this. So uh, here's my understanding of this, right? Uh, that when you take about, when you take a, think of all of these people, I mean, God says, I will harden their hearts. Uh, it is not, uh, it has to be understood consistent with the rest of scripture. So any interpretation of the specific has to be done taking into account the whole general uh, uh, revelation of scripture. That means when I want to interpret what God did with Pharaoh or with King Saul or, you know, with Jacob and Esau or any, any, other, any other situation, it has to be interpreted in the light of the rest of scripture. So... Uh, in the light, in the light of in the entirety of Scripture, um, there is human will, and God never controls human will. He can influence, like we saw. He can stir up. He can, you know, uh, move. He can uh, 
make you know cause to make willing in that sense like by stirring up or moving or so on influencing in a you know in a inspiring in a positive way but the end result is that uh, sorry the, the the individual is still in a place where they can choose to obey or choose to disobey god will inspire him god will move god will stir up god will you know try to urge uh, but the individual has to make that choice so same thing uh, when it comes to hard and it comes to the case of hardening it's not that uh, uh, the individual does not have a choice Pharaoh chose to harden his heart as he saw God work uh, so that's the correct way to understand it that's how I would see it or I would explain it that the hardening of heart the position of coming saying I'm going to be against God is the individual's choice that is not imposed by God so for example because and, and this is very important so for example you know think about Judas the person in the Bible God foretold or for near that Judas was going to betray Jesus. But can Judas stand before God and say, God, you made me betray Jesus so that the world could be saved. So I deserve the best place in heaven because if I had not done that, the world could not be saved. Can Judas present that as an argument to God? You know, literally, if we go by, you know, uh, that position saying God dictated their choice, then Judas has a great case before God. God, you forced me to betray Jesus. The world could be saved. Therefore, it was not my fault. You made me do it. Therefore, I need the best place in heaven or I deserve the best place in heaven. Or if Judas did it as an act of his own free will, then he will bear the consequence of his choice. So which one of the two would be most logical? Definitely the second one, that is Judas made the choice. God foreknew and spoke about him, but it was Judas who made the final choice to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And so uh, understanding the hardening of Pharaoh's heart and so on, we have to understand it as Pharaoh made the choice or whoever, you know. So even Jacob and Esau, even before the two were born, and, and Paul deals with this in Romans 9, he says, um, uh, uh, um, uh, even before Jacob and Esau made were born, God said, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. Now, how can the God speak like that? Well, that is because he foreknew what they would do. He spoke about, spoke about things ahead of time based on their choice they will make, but the choice they made was entirely their choice, not dictated by God. God spoke of it ahead of time, but they made their choice. So, Esau didn't opt for a bowl of porridge and sell his birthright because God made him do it. No, he made the choice. And Hebrews 12 brings it out. But God, knowing about that in advance, said, I love Jacob. I hate Esau because Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of porridge. So everything has to be understood in the light of the rest of Scripture. And we understand that you know God doesn't dictate human will. He does try to influence. He dies just try to move us, but he doesn't override. Yes. I hope that's clear to you uh, and answers your question, Beth. Um, can I just uh, ask, because it says, I will harden his heart. So that the I will shows kind of like something active. Mm -hmm. um, so like when we think of Pharaoh, we all so, okay, the devil was you know, he was under the devil's influence. But can we 
infer when God says, I will harden his heart. Okay, he still had a freedom of choice, but God uh, influenced his, uh, you know, maybe um, by bringing different um, experiences to into his life or whatever, influenced him to go in to make choices of hardening his heart. Can we think of it like that? Because the I will is a very active kind of a way of saying something. Mm. So if we just think, oh, God just allowed the devil to make his heart, you know, allowed the devil to influence him um, to have a hard heart, then that's not being active, that's being passive. But these passages that talk about different people who've had hearts hardened, it's, it comes across as God being active in that process, whether or not they even have a free choice, which, okay, we all agree they did, but was God active in bringing that about? That's a different sort of thing I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand it. My, and, um, you know, we need to think about this a little bit more. Um, but my one thought that comes to my mind in response to that is, uh, would God, in effect, be working against himself, right, uh, by doing that? Would he be self-contradictory? That is, I want Pharaoh to let my people go, but, uh, you know, so what would be the most logical thing God should influence Pharaoh to do? Should he influence Pharaoh to become willing and let, to let his people go? Or should he influence Pharaoh to say, no, I don't want to let my people go? What would be the most logical thing? And I'm just thinking logically and thinking aloud here. I mean, it's a very good question. Uh, we need to spend some time on it. Um, but as I am thinking about your question, uh, what would be the most logical thing? Would God work against himself? I want to get my people out, but I'm going to make this man say no. Uh, or I want to get my people out, so I'm going to make this man say yes. Now, how should I influence him? And uh, of course, I'm going to show my power. Of course, I'm going to do great things. They, you know, the Red Sea had to be parted anyway. Uh, the miracles had to take place. So what would be, you know, most logical? Uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't want to answer the question right away. Uh, I think we just need to give it a little bit of time. So let's take some time to think about it. Um, Another, another another instance, I guess, we can think about maybe is um, when um, Nehemiah prayed um, and the king's heart was, I guess we could say, softened towards Nehemiah um, rebuilding the temple. Um, and the king actually gave him all that he needed and sent him on his way with resources and everything. So that's kind of maybe what you're saying. Why would God work against himself when mm. there is a, you know, a different way? But I, I just find that I will is very mm. active. So what, what does that actually mean? You know, when he says, I will harden their heart. Um, mm. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, just give me uh, seven days. <laughs> I will bring this question up again next class. Uh, and let me think about this, uh, uh, and uh, I, I will come back with an answer. Hopefully, it will uh, address this this aspect of the question. You know, what the active part? Yeah. So let me just think about it a little bit. Okay, I, I, I see first others. Of, yeah. First, of, in uh, in line with the Beth's question, mm -hmm. that uh, if we highlight, uh, if we ponder on the words, is from Romans one twenty four. Like mm -hmm. uh, 22, 23, 24, where uh, God says uh, they have uh, God has given them to their desires, fleshly desires, mm -hmm. because like uh, their hearts were not turning. They know what is right, mm -hmm. but they are not turning their hearts from their sin. So mm -hmm. eventually, God gives them to those sins like That's, that. So mm -hmm. yeah, good, good, good. Yes, yeah, so that phrase, God gave them up, I, I see it here, it's, it's three, repeated three times in Romans chapter 1. 
you know, God gave them up, God gave them up, God gave them up. So uh, we just let them go into those things. Okay, good. Okay, um, you know, I, uh, we are out of time, but there is a question from Kennedy. There's a question from Christopher. Uh, yeah, so Christopher, that those references we will pick up um, next class from you know the the last part. Uh, we will pick it up next week. Um, okay, Kennedy, back of Oh, okay, Kennedy, the answer answer your question. Vagabond spirit. Um, uh, yeah, it doesn't even sound right, so it cannot be from God. Um, yeah, uh, so and I'm not sure in what context. Okay, so what we able to say? I see your hand raised there, but we need to go for a break. Um, oh, oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll be very quick. I, I, I was just thinking, maybe to before next class, the clarity between the on the verse of God hating Esau and loving Jacob. I, yeah. I don't know. Is it? Could it be that that verse is talking about nations, the nation of Israel and the nation of um, Esau, or is it talking about preference? And I will make my reference to what Jesus said about hating our parents right um basically what jesus was saying there was that we should uh, choose god above our loved ones our parents mm -hmm. i don't know if you remember that scripture so i'm just wondering uh, could it be that it was he's talking about a nation or was he talking about preference that he chooses jake the children of israel above the nation of um, esau because I've struggled in a way to accept that God actually hated Jacob. I'm sorry, Esau, my apologies. Hated mm. Esau, you know, even before he was born and loved mm. Jacob, um, Jacob before he was born. And which in some, uh, in some circles of Christianity, we talk about the um, predetermination, if I'm correct, mm. you know, where God determines things before and it just goes contrary to everything that we know about God, you know, if indeed there are actually people destined for hell, you know, that argument supports that notion or that idea. So but I, I differ from that. So I don't know if we can get more clarity on that verse. Uh, God loves Esau and God loves Jacob and hates Esau. Is it nation he's talking about or preference? You know, I don't know. I, 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 I will just need more clarity on that, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was um, uh, referring to Romans chapter 9, verse 12 and 13. Uh, and and, and uh, so what I was saying was, see, God, God knew their choices. And God is speaking with reference to the choices they will make, uh, not necessarily as them as individuals. As individuals, they are people. There is Jacob, there is Esau. Uh, but Esau was going to, or he was going to sell his birthright uh, for the sake of uh, just a meal. And then Hebrews 12 brings that out, saying, don't be like that. And so when God was saying, you know, I love Jacob, I hate Esau, uh, he's really speaking about what Esau is expressing. That means I'm selling something spiritual, so important for the sake of something fleshly. And that's where, you know, so for example, when God hates sin. So we understand it. He's talking about the sin, the work, the rather than the sinner himself. So in that sense, so that's how, you know, I, I try to explain that, you know, when God says, I love Jacob, I hate Esau, it's with reference to the choice they make uh, and not necessarily as them as people. You know, God loves every person. We know that. He loves Jacob. He loves Esau as people but he's speaking in terms of what their actions represent uh, and the consequences of what happened. Uh, and so that's what I was trying to say. And so Hebrews 12 tells us not to do that, not to be like Esau, uh, where we sell the spiritual for the sake of the fleshly. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay, so um, we... Um, um, 
So what we'll do is uh, if there are more questions, we will pick this up next week. And I think next next year I have to make this course a two, two hour course uh, because there's, there's a lot of good questions. But anyway, um, we'll do our best this semester. Uh, we will uh, continue this next week. Uh, I will have to come back with an answer for Beth and also um, any other questions we have. We will pick up with the last section of chapter four. We will talk about the analogies mentioned there. And uh, then we will get, get into the next chapter where we talk about the spiritual experiences of the human spirit. So it's very interesting when you look in the Bible, what kind of spiritual experiences the human spirit has, you know, of what, what, would we, what we see in scripture, because we should open up our spirit to have those kind of spiritual experiences. Okay, um, so let's go for a break. Uh, I know we're all, uh, already over, but maybe in about five to 10 minutes, uh, we can join the next class. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna just uh, close off here and we will, I'll, we'll meet you in the next class, okay? Thank you, God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, everyone, thank you.